And today we have two awesome guests, Stacy and Carmi, and we're going to be focusing on the role of social media, both for enterprises or even government agencies and nonprofits, but also how that ties into individual social media management and leveraging the talent you have in your organization to strengthen both their development and also your organization. Love to start off with an introduction from Stacy. Oh, thank you, Hans. Um, hello, everybody. This is my first time on HAPS. Uh, it's an interesting space. I am in social media. I'm the director of social media at Infotech. I work with Carmi and Hans and love every minute of it. But HAPS is new. HAPS is new so be kind to me, please. Um, my, I came from entertainment. Uh, I was not in front of the camera. I'm always behind the camera. Uh, I started with music. Uh, so I chose music for film and TV and video games. And it was a wonderful job in my 20s, but plateaued uh, <laughs> in when it came to financially. Uh, and then I got into marketing and kind of entered the world of social. So I went to NYU and uh, did digital marketing there. Uh, worked at a bunch of ad agencies, global ad agencies, and then landed at this wonderful research firm uh, with Carmi and Hans. Fantastic. And that's a great handover to Carmi. Appreciate you coming back to the show again and sharing your wealth of knowledge. It's great to be back, uh, Hans. Thanks so much for having me. As So not my first time, but I'm still pretty you know, new to the HAPS rodeo. So thanks for going easy on us. It's uh, Always a joy to, to be back with you, Hans. Love that, that you're you're in the mix with us here, Stacy. This is, you know, we talk all day, but never in this context. So this is a lot of fun. So yes, by day, um, I work directly with Stacy. I'm director of public relations at Infotech Research Group. Um, my background is uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, I have been an analyst, a technology analyst at Infotech as well. Um, and you know, one of the reasons why I was so excited about us getting together today to talk about this was that I have used social media through much of my career as a journalist, uh, especially when I was working freelance uh, and essentially camping out at my kitchen table and trying to build a brand. It was social media that allowed me to uh, fight outside my weight class and to you know, get large platforms, Canada's largest broadcasters and uh, digital and print media to pay attention um, and, to, and to actually be able to work with them. It was social media that allowed me to create the brand uh, that I wanted to, that allowed me to build the network uh, that would benefit me, that allowed me to create sustained opportunities to tell stories and connect with people in meaningful ways. And so, you know, being able to take all that experience and bring it to Infotech is, uh, you know, let's face it, it's a, it's a, a content uh, specialist's dream come true. Uh, and so I'm really thrilled. Thanks, Hans, for allowing us to come on today and talk about this because uh, there are few topics that are closer, nearer, and dearer to my heart. Well, thank you both for joining in. And for everyone who's uh, wherever you're watching from, feel for, uh, please use the comments to share any questions, stories, anything that you'd like. Uh, I'll definitely work those in as we're going forward. So if you have questions for our two wonderful experts, please let us know as we go along. And just kind of starting off in level setting, when we think of social media, influencers, celebrities, Twitter wars, these things pop to mind. But what is the role for social media with today's companies? How does it play in and why is it so critical outside? You know, we, we do see some that are crushing it on Twitter or launch some viral campaigns, but you know, those are kind of the oddities. What is the role of social media to an enterprise, to a nonprofit, to a government agency? Why is it critical as part of their communication strategy? A connection. It just it's not much different than just us being on social media. They, you know, brands want to connect with their customers, partners. I think first and foremost, um, the struggle with brands is that it's not an individual, like, do you have a personality? So you, there's a lot of work a brand needs to, to do in order to do social media right. Uh, you do need to have a unique and authentic personality. Um, and 
so yeah, it's it's connection and brand awareness. That would probably be my the the number one and two for me. And then obviously conversion, like, you know, you know, what is your objective? If you're, if you're making money, then obviously like is social media actually bringing in money for you or, or if you're a nonprofit signups, uh, et cetera. So I would say those three things, I don't know, Carmi, what, how would you add anything there? Yeah, I completely agree. And I think, you know, the, the way I sort of position social media in my brain, the only way that I can really absorb it is I, I think about what's the first thing that I do when I hear about a brand or a company, it's right? I, I creep them online, right? I want to find out more about them. All of us want to do business with organizations that we like doing business with, right? you know? So what do we, you know, how do we get to that point where we can be converted into a sale? We want to learn about them. What makes them tick? Are they my kind of people? Is that a company that I'd be proud to do business with? And increasingly social media is, is that first contact point. So the first thing you're going to learn about a brand is probably going to be when you Google their their social media accounts, and and you know invariably those social media accounts will pop to the top of a of a of a search, uh, and so uh, you know it's it's almost like the first point of entry. It's the gateway into a brand, and so you know mm -hmm. as 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 you know organizations, uh, they're going to want to make sure that they're putting the right resources into that place to make the right first impression, and then sustain that first impression over time. And then the flip side of that is, is that, you know, there are, we are all brands as well, right? There are companies that obviously every company has to brand, but we as individuals um, are creating, uh, you know, brands and personas for ourselves as well. We're all selling something. Uh, and the, the, the joy of social media is just how democratic it is, right? We can create our own points of presence there as well. We can build that same sense so that when someone creeps us online and wants to find out about us, if they want to do business with us, if they want to connect with us, if they want to be part of our network, this is where we get to make that awesome first impression. And this is where we get to have those amazing conversations over time. So it cuts both ways on both an organizational and an, and an individual level. But that's the amazing thing about social media. It's a platform on which we can all build those brands. We all have that those tools in our hands. Early on in my career, I had the opportunity, well, I was forced into sales training. But one of the things that I still remember to this day was we have this big aversion to sales and salespeople. It's that you know, crooked used car salesman or somebody who's trying to force something upon us that we don't want but they benefit from versus really the sales facilitator, the person who believes passionately in the product or service that they're a net promoter. They want you to experience it as well. And that that type of salesperson, they're sharing their passion, their value, and hoping that you'll get the same value out. And that's kind of that good thing. And Helen brings up in the comments that social media has kind of taken on that same problem where these so-called influencers are now maybe <laughs> the evil salespeople where they're trying to get us, to, they're trying to build up their network so that they can get paid to push products through their channel that they may or may not care about. And I'm 100% unsponsored, not necessarily by choice, but when we're talking about companies, the goal is to gain brand recognition, to share their products and services. How, do, you know, how are we, how does that influencer concept apply to companies? And is there a better term that we could be using for people that are, and we're going to get into our program a little bit, where we're finding employees and we're trying to get them more exposure on media to share the great work we're doing, but we really wouldn't call them influencers because we're not using them to, you know, try and push or sell our services to anybody. I can't ever recall there being a sales pitch in one of them. So how does this apply and translate to companies and how can they be authentic? Yeah, it's a great question. Like Helen, I, I saw your comments pop up. I kind of giggled. You're right. I don't like influencer either anymore. And I honestly, like, what word do you choose? I don't know. I'm going to choose ambassador and it's a wrong word. But it's it's like I think it's the meaning of it. And Hans, you kind of came at it from both ways. It's just like, you know, how does a brand work with individuals to help meet their objectives, whether that individual is within their organization or external, like our traditional 
influencer that are basically creating an Instagram profile and they're, you know, getting, uh, you know, a thousand likes, they've got a hundred thousand followers and they're open, you know, to sponsorships. Um, so with those individuals to start there, it's, it's changing. I don't know where I stand personally. I've worked with influencers. I worked on Chevrolet and General Motors, and we've worked with a lot of influencers there. Did they get us? Did they did they help us sell cars? I don't think they did, but they got a lot of likes with one of our vehicles in their posts. But it does work for some brands. And I think it's like you got to find the right person to work with. It's not about going and finding a Kim Kardashian to sell your makeup. It's just, you got to go, I have the specific makeup. I need to find somebody that connects with me as a brand and actually believes in me as a brand. Because if they're just going to kind of go, hey, here's this, you know, great lipstick, but they're not actually using it, their fans are going to see right through you and they're not going to buy that brand. So those are like some lessons I've learned personally when working with influencers. Uh, and if you are an influencer, uh, like Hans, you mentioned, some people are trying to, to gain their recognition here. I would say be, be mindful of if a brand connects with you and they want a partner, does it fit right with your brand? You have to interview them just as much as they interview you. Yes, there can be a cash trans, you know, uh, transaction there, but what if your followers that you've acquired that may have equated to 100,000 followers and you're kind of selling them on a, I don't, I don't know, a, a, a phone, a Samsung or Huawei or, you know, a device and they're just not buying it. They're like, I don't want that. And that's not you. I can see right yep. through you. So it's going to hurt you. Um, sorry, I kind of spent a little too much time on that. Um you know, when it comes to finding individuals within your company, um, you know, I'm director of social media, it's, uh, you know, trying to find authentic people within your company that can, you know, where social media is easy, and they're comfortable with themselves, you don't really want to force people into doing something they don't want to do. And I also think you need to find the right platform for them. So if you want, you know, your wider employee base to be on social media, you can't all tell them to turn on their camera and, and create a video. You have to like sit down with them and go, what are you comfortable with? What platforms do you like? And actually, what do you want to say? And it's not a one size fits all. And I think it comes down to like when it looks in internally, it's like, where can they be the most authentic person they can and also benefit the brand? Carmi, yeah. you come from a, a news and media background where integrity and, and truth in journalism has been, you know, a hotspot for you, uh, especially with some of the trends and the, now that social media and others have made it so easy to broadcast information, figuring out what's true is harder. How does that authenticity play into your perspective on finding these brand ambassadors, these social ambassadors to help represent your brand and trusting that they can do so with integrity and, and represent it properly? Well, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Definitely the key word here is authenticity. Helen, you know, you're right. The key word here is authentic and, uh, you know, you know, there's a there's a wide gulf between someone having a lot of followers, uh, you know, posting something about which they truly don't believe, not really adding value to the conversation, not really helping their stakeholders, the people they connect with on social platforms, advance their state. They simply want to sell them something or take the money and run. And so it's it's almost unfair. We've kind of ruined the word influencer because here at this early, relatively early stage of social media, um, it's gotten a bad rap because there are those who do want to cash in and aren't necessarily authentic, aren't necessarily having those value-added conversations with us, uh, aren't really moving the bar, uh, you know, raising the bar or moving it forward. They really are concerned with the short-term benefits to themselves, and it really isn't a symbiotic relationship at all. And so that's, you know, coming from a media you know, background where it's all about integrity, the exact opposite of integrity, right? You, 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 you tune into a uh, to media content because 
uh, it is legitimate because it is not misinformation because it helps you make better decisions. It, it informs you in ways that you need to know. Um, and I think that informs how businesses need to communicate through these channels as well is that uh, you know, the goal should not be uh, desperately seeking reactions or likes or you know, specific social media metrics. You have to ask yourself the question, are you having the meaning, those meaningful conversations uh, with the people who matter to you as a brand? And are you adding value to that relationship? And you know, I think we've all become social media savvy enough in recent years that we can easily tell the difference uh, when someone is pay to play, when someone is not a legit, you know, when someone really does wear the influencer uh, title or label um, and isn't truly sincere, isn't interested in uh, building that meaningful relationship over time, just wants to cash in and then move on to their next mark. I think over time, as our collective level of savviness increases, uh, we will become better at filtering that and knowing as we cruise different social media platforms and as we experience them, um, where those value added resources are. Who are the people we should trust uh, and who should we stay away from? Uh, and I think it's becoming clear, but you know, the responsibility at the end of the day is us. We have to become really good filters when we take to social media so that we spend our limited time and energy connecting with individuals and brands that will get us to that level of symbiosis and value and don't waste our time with you know, things that you know, obviously nobody cares about. Right. Mm -hmm. I often tell some of our members when I'm meeting them for the first time that the reason I joined Infotech was I discovered that there was a, a service out there that could have given me the help and guidance I needed throughout my IT career. And imagine how far I could have gotten had I had access to this research, to these guides, to this level of help. And that's really what brought me to the company. And I really enjoy how Infotech has expanded to provide more information that's publicly available to share some of these knowledges, uh, knowledge. I'm not sure if it started with Carmi's tech brief, but certainly for me, that was one of the first really social areas where we were sharing free content and telling people how to learn more. We also experimented with Infotech Live and up until everything got shut down, it was another forum to share information. And when that kind of shut down, I was really happy to see Carmi and Stacy and others start to pick up and say, how else can we reach people? We have Brian Jackson, who does a wonderful podcast, if you've ever had a chance to listen to it, called Tech Insights. What are some of the ways, Stacy, you mentioned finding a channel, finding a vehicle for the employees to feel comfortable and actually learn to develop broadcasting in these different mediums. Tell us a little more about how you are building kind of this comprehensive program and giving people an opportunity to learn and experience with the guidance and support from people like you and Carmi, the video team and other professionals. Yeah, well, Carmi and I work on the program together. We're, you know, tied at the hip on this. And just, uh, you know, to go back to, you know, it's a, it's ultimately your objective. Like, what, what do you want to achieve when you go online? Um, it should never just be, I'm going to be everywhere um, and I'm going to produce the same content across all channels. Like, I think you just need to be quite strategic when you approach online. Otherwise, you're going to do a lot of things. You may not get much in results. Uh, so, you know, I, I like the idea of pick one channel and do it really well. Um, so, you know, working with an individual and just finding, well, they, they're kind of witty in their writing skills. Um, they already have uh, an okay following on Twitter. Um, they follow journalists that, you know, kind of just makes sense. Well, let's try Twitter, you know, and you can kind of just share your articles and writing there. Um, whereas someone like yourself, you're comfortable with video content. So, you know, um, you know, YouTube, all of that. So it's just, you know, having those conversations and then kind of you know, kind of matching it with your objective and, and testing out those channels. I would prefer to have hyper focus first and then slowly broaden it, it out from there. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, my sense. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they first dip their toe into the social media waters is that they don't dip their toes in, they dive in at first. 
and they try to take on everything. They, you know, they they try to they set themselves up on multiple platforms, and then they think they can cover them all. Just you know, you know I'll, I'll I'll post it on LinkedIn, and then I'll just copy and paste it and throw it onto Twitter, and then I'll do I'll do something else, and I'll Facebook. And before you know it, you realize that you're you're spreading yourself too thin. You're not having those meaningful conversations. You're trying to to focus on quantity where you really should be focusing on quality. And so you know, this is a great opportunity to put the blinders on, decide which tool you're most comfortable with and just focus on that just to get yourself started. This isn't so much a, a process as it is a culture. Uh, and really what you're doing is you're evolving your personal culture in a different direction. You're using these tools that are still very new. We are all still figuring them out. Um, and you've got to determine what you're comfortable with. And that takes time. And you have to give yourself that opportunity to take that time. Um, and so once you do that, you play with it for a little while. You post a few things. You start engaging in conversations. You consume other people's content and you comment on those. And so it isn't just a matter of posting stuff and waiting for the world to beat a path to your door. It's about engaging in meaningful conversation in a limited fashion to determine what you're comfortable doing and what you're not comfortable doing. Where do those, bear, where do those lines exist? Where are the borders? Um, and then over time, obviously, the more comfortable you get, the more you roll up your sleeves, the deeper you can get into it. Maybe after a few months, you can add another platform. You know, you've been hearing about this LinkedIn thing and you're starting to get some traction on Twitter. So let's add some LinkedIn and experiment with that too. But the trick is to start slow and really let it sink in. Let yourself become comfortable with it and play with it, but don't chase the numbers. It's all about quality conversation and having a meaningful impact. Even if it isn't on a lot of people, it's not about having a large audience. It's about having a meaningful impact on, even if it's just one person uh, who is who's meaningful to your organization or your brand or, or whatever. So, you know, just don't try to boil the ocean, put those blinders on and focus and don't worry so much about going viral. Um, it really is not as, you know, I think that's what the influencers would like to have us believe. I've got a hundred thousand followers. Um, but are they moving the needle? You know, you, you can actually accomplish quite a lot by simply having a small audience, but they're engaged. And I, I love how you phrase that when, you know, I've been writing LinkedIn articles for a while, not as much as I wanted to, trying to get that regular cadence out. And one of the hardest things for me was not chasing the likes. Anytime I publish something on bad bosses or really negative, it, 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 LinkedIn started reinforcing it. Hey, you got 500 views. You got all these comments. And it made me want to kind of write for the reaction instead of mm -hmm. why I was there and what I hope to achieve. And I think a good example of that is Infotech started up a number of affinity groups to really help empower and drive representation across different groups. And recently, as part of Black History Month, we had um, Allison Straker, one of our wonderful research directors, actually interview and sit down and have a great conversation with Rob Meikle, the former CIO of City of Toronto. And it was on LinkedIn, great professional network considering where we wanted to broadcast that, but it was a sincere, conversation and the engagement and participation in the comments with people sharing stories, sharing mm -hmm. their perspective, you know, did it have a hundred thousand views or likes? I haven't looked lately, probably not, but the engagement in the audience and the participation was so deep. How do you, how does something like that come to be? What drives the thought to, to put that content out and really, you know, take a risk and put something out that is, a very serious discussion on uh, as far as companies would go these days. Yeah, so I worked on that. I was in behind the scenes where I'm the most comfortable, but for you, Hans, I'm coming in front of the camera. So it was amazing to watch. And to answer your question, um, you know, Allison and, and Rob, they were vulnerable and there's strength in vulnerability. And to have those conversations are risky to talk about diversity, to talk about personal experiences and and what they thought of when you know what they were thinking when George Floyd was shot. You know, how has the pandemic personally affected them? Like those are heavy conversations. And their objective was to make those awkward conversations okay to have. Um, 
how do you go about that? I, I don't know yet. I think we're still all navigating, like, you know, an online conversation can go sideways, right? But you do need to kind of have like little notes. Don't say this, don't do that. Uh, Michael's on here, he knows. I've been telling him on how he should uh, <laughs> manage his social channels. So he's taking my tips, but, uh, you know, we're all adults. Uh, and I hope everybody wrote like, uh, read the community guidelines on haps i did for those 100 coins uh but it's true like you just have to kind of you know sense it out and like there's certain risks you can take uh, uh i think it's also listening online listening is key like what conversations are really popular right now and can you contribute it and can you add value uh you know whether it's telling your story or helping others so I don't know if I really directly answered your okay. question there, but it is, yeah, that was a really great example, Hans. How So how, for, for the people here who are developing their brand, developing their presence, or maybe trying to bring this capability within their organization, how do you find the right channel, the right format, what are some of the things that go into these discussions? Because, you know, we with Infotech, we publish research, we have a website, there's videos that are available to go along with it, there's tech brief, there's podcasts, there's LinkedIn Live, like there's all these opportunities. We have Andy Neal who's doing quick Twitter videos talking about whatever's trending in his area every day uh, and people are following that. How do you figure out what goes in, like what are the channels that you could use and what type of content fits where? Because I know, it's been baffling for me and a and a big struggle. I I don't do Twitter very well. I don't really. I haven't figured out the value to me. How does how do individuals and companies start to have that conversation? Well, I think you may have answered your own question, Hans. Is that I, I think it all comes down to personal comfort. You know, Andy is incredibly comfortable at you know pulling out his phone and you know posting something straight up to Twitter. He can be on a bike ride, and you know here he is sharing it on Twitter, and and that's his comfort zone. And I and you know I take from that, uh, you know the the message from that is is whatever your comfort zone is. In other words, if this is the tool that you've been playing with, it you know, you feel at home in, then that's where you should focus on. Don't overthink it. Don't spend too much time thinking about, uh, you know, where's my audience? Who's my audience? If, if you're comfortable using the tool, throw it up, try something, see if you can make some kind of meaningful connection, and then go from there. Um, and then over time, obviously, you know, you, you can become a little bit more uh, deliberate about your choice. So, for example, if you are, uh, if you're, if you're launching, if you want to talk about a certain aspect of business, and you know, you don't think that Facebook is ideal for you, well, then you know, maybe you want, may want to eventually move it over from Facebook to LinkedIn because that's where they're going to talk about, you know, the particular topics that you're especially interested in. So, there is some truth to the fact that certain platforms are better for certain kinds of interactions, but if you're just starting out and you're not sure where to start. Go with what you're comfortable with because what matters more than is it the perfect match of a platform is are you happy with it Are to the point that you're going to use it regularly, that you're going to interact, that you're not just going to post, but you're going to engage in bi-directional conversation. Um, these things are important. And you know, you've said you're not comfortable using Twitter in that way. So you found alternate platforms in that way. A again, there's no right or wrong. It's like fashion and you know, taste in food. Uh, I like certain dishes, other people might not, doesn't make my choices right or wrong or anything like that. It's just, it's whatever we choose to use and whatever we're happy with. And, you know, I can be successful in business on, on, uh, on a Twitter just as much as I can LinkedIn. The important thing is that I'm using it. Mm -hmm. I also like what Vaughn Allen uh, just uh, wrote about networking is key. That's huge. We forget we forget to network. We kind of just go, I'm going to try Instagram and I'm going to test it out. And I, I'm like, this picture is so pretty. Why is nobody liking it? Well, you forgot to build your network. Um, you know, as he said, you're not going to get the views. Uh, you know, they're going to get overlooked. And I think that's a big thing on LinkedIn. I don't know if 
you know, the majority of people are on LinkedIn here, but it's it's the number one, you know, business uh, platform to be on. And I do notice that a lot of people are discouraged. I'm not getting those likes. And I also have another comment regarding likes. So I'm going to hold that thought. But you get so focused on, on that and you kind of forget that, okay, I'm talking about IT, but my network's all entertainment film and entertainment, they don't care about what I'm talking about in technology and, you know, you know cybersecurity. So you got to just really look at that network that you already have and like make sure that you're providing content that they can engage in or change that network altogether. Um, but don't need to digress, but there was a really great point earlier about measuring engagement. And Hans, you said that you were like writing for the like. Um, and I would love people's comments here. I don't know if you've heard of Birdwatch. So Twitter launched Birdwatch and it's in a beta program right now. And, and uh, what they're doing is they're getting, you know, a community together to monitor posts uh, for misinformation and kind of, you know, help Twitter kind of clean up the channel and rewarding that way. So I'm, I'm curious what you guys would think, like we should reward the most helpful, not who has the most likes. Uh, I thought that was an interesting spin. I don't know if it's gonna work. Uh, I actually ran a poll uh, on it on LinkedIn and majority of people said it won't work, but I do like the idea of rewarding people helping others. I think that would just kind of balance out the negativity on social media that we have seen you know, recently. And I think that's, it's one of the things, and I, I thank Mac, Michael Bathurst. We've been talking and working for a while. He's been very supportive as I knew I wanted to start broadcasting, but I hadn't quite figured out where or how, because I need, I need more structure than others. So I had to have it worked out before I was willing to start. And one of the things I think is a credit to the HAPS team is allowing that content to be syndicated in channels that we also want to broadcast. So yes. we can do it here and blast it out. And to Vaughn's point, build and hit our existing networks with content that might be relevant. And they've also really cured, I, I think, some pitfalls with the other platforms. You can, if you monetization is a driver, you can immediately get sponsored or get rewards. And it's as easy as clicking stay safe and you just got a dime. A dime isn't that much, but it's an immediate recognition. And as you need to see the people who are scrolling through, you know, we've got some amazing super commenters and super publishers mm -hmm. here, even joining in the comment section. And that like uh, Helen, top commenter, these are recognitions that the platform is putting out to give a reward, even if it's non-monetary to the people who really are driving and improving the platform and the engagement on it. Mm -hmm. I think anything that encourages qualitative engagement over quantitative engagement, um, it, it behooves the platforms to find a way. I think uh, the quantitative strategy, which really has dominated social media since the very early days of social media, um, and even before, like, you know, long ago when you would post to a blog, how, how did you tell the effective ones from the non-effective ones, the ones that got lots of comments? Um, and so, Online has always been a numbers game and social has kind of picked that up. But, you know, we're, we finally have technologies and platforms and capabilities that can move us beyond that um, and shift the conversation in a different direction. I, 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 and then it doesn't seem like you're trying to be uh, heard in the wind. It allows you to more thoughtfully find the audiences that are relevant to you, even if they're smaller, even if they're niche, and have those proper conversations with them. You don't feel the need to become viral, become massively popular as a way of validating your value, because that really isn't what social is all about, despite everything we've been conditioned to believe in recent years. Um, you know, we say it isn't a numbers game, but, you know, let's let's be clear. You see a headline that says how many tens of millions of followers a certain celebrity has, and our brains just kind of go there. But if, as we're starting to build our own brands on these platforms, uh, we need to you know, sort of set that aside uh, and think about not necessarily even about what we're sharing outright. If you don't want to post anything, at least as you're starting, you don't have to. Engaging in social media can even be logging in, signing up to some groups on LinkedIn, listening in, um, maybe contributing to the conversation here and there. But you don't have to be a publisher if you don't want to be. 
social media allows you to determine that level of engagement that you think drives the most value. But do like don't not participate because you're afraid that you know. Well, I haven't blown big just yet, so why am I even bothering? That's not what this is all about. So I guess my entire life of not being popular and not having a lot of friends is actually the perfect start to getting into social media. Quality, man. That's what it's all about. <laughs> exactly. To be honest, like on my Instagram profile, I just post photos of my dog because I know that's going to get likes, right? And it's, yeah. it shouldn't be that way. I'm not going to post photos of myself. I'm like, oh, whatever. But like, you know, it, it, it's weird how that has kind of framed our curation for social, our individual curation, um, you know, because we are a slave to the likes and the comments and it would just be nice to connect globally and just have that connection separate from the comments and likes. And I don't know, I, I'm sure there are channels out there that are working towards that. Uh, we had a rough couple of years recently, so, <laughs> you know, with, on social media, so with trolls and whatnot, but so hopefully, if we this turns it around and i think michael's a start there with his uh, sunday morning broadcasts absolutely yep and that's you know for those who don't know michael uh hosts and and i kind of co-host and try and keep things from running off the road it's just a casual talk about business ongoing topics things that are affecting us professionally our organizations more. We get into some personal stuff occasionally too. That's on Sunday, anywhere from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time, depending on who's gonna be on. It's a great show to drop in. It's casual, it's fun, it's often funny. One of the things, and, and I think this comes up is, we talked about authentic and sincere people. And like, we've got Helen and Frazier and Vaughn and a number of people that I've met through this platform that really, I enjoy watching them. And I don't watch a lot of social content. I just don't have time, but I enjoy their authenticity, their sincerity and their focus. One of the things I've noticed as we've tried to bring people on to appear more in front of a camera or on a podcast or write more for the company in these forums is, overcoming that initial fear. Mm -hmm. Frazier, uh, excuse me, um, Fritz, who's with our security practice, was on the Sunday show, and it was just amazing. He is brilliant, and it was smooth. And I had Valance on talking about, la last week talking about governance, and he also covers risk in our area. And again, somebody who is comfortable being on stage, but both were really nervous about getting on and, and doing a platform like this, but immediately once they got into it, loved it, and now they're like, all right, I think I want to do my own show. I really, I caught the bug. How do, you, how do we help support our employees and create that safe environment to test and find out what is your platform? What is your theme? What are you comfortable doing? How do we help our teammates get more comfortable so that they can build confidence, build skills that are value to them? And then by doing that, we're also enhancing our organization's brand and value. Hmm. It's a good question. I think, I don't know why I'm instantly going, like maybe, you know, if it, when it comes to video, like having a closed Zoom meeting, like bring on your employees, like test, test on your peers. Uh, sometimes you just got to jump right in. It's just like, you know, going to a swimming pool and you climb that diving board. You just kind of got to jump. Uh, I don't, I don't know. And you're going to fail and failing's okay. It's okay to trip over your words and kind of mess things up. I think you gotta, you, you gotta be okay with that. And to be honest, your audience will be okay with that as well. Um, just be yourself. I think that's the thing. And I'm seeing more people are being their, themselves, especially during the pandemic. Um, you know, we're not wearing our ties and suits. We're, we're, we're kind of letting things loose, wearing our sweatpants and we're opening people into our rooms. I'm in a spare room right now. And so, you know, here's my big plans. I'm not at the office. Um, I, I think that helps. Uh, I, and I think the only way that I think how I would help, you know, with my colleagues is just, it's okay if, 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 things don't work out, if their connection is wrong, if you, you know, you mess things up, um, it's fine. We'll do it again. We'll try something different. 
I think organizations need to recognize that uh, this is probably the greatest opportunity to empower your people. Uh, by encouraging them to leverage these tools, they can uh, tighten their relationships with their networks and with the, the, you know, with your clients, with your prospects, with the entire community that you have traditionally dealt with as an organization. You now have these incredibly flexible new channels to build relationships and seal people to your brand. And so, you know, again, sort of going back to my original point. We do business with the organizations that you know where we like the people, right? I I, I want to buy from someone I like, and so you know if I happen to visit their Instagram account, and I do this all the time, I pop into their social media accounts. I like to see what makes people tick before I get on the phone with them for work, um, and. And if I see that they too have a dog, well, there's a point of connection with us, right? If I see that they're also interested in photography, I can now see them not just as people, but not just as business people, but people, um, which can further solidify that connection that I have with them. So it's an incredibly great means of getting to know people, getting others to know you, which is perfect for business. It's perfectly aligned with what business is all about. Uh, and so in, in an era where it's incredibly easy for me to click from company A to company B because all the products are the same and you know that, but that one is cheaper. Um, the thing that's going to keep me stuck to a brand is 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 those relationships that I built up with people and organizations that empower their people to use social media platforms to act in this way and provide the resources to train and provide the the training grounds for them so that they can try things out without worrying about falling on their face. Um, and to you know, sort of continue to advance those skills and celebrate and celebrate those achievements. Um, those are the organizations that will succeed in the long run, um, and those are the organizations that will create you know the kind of cult uh, of support from stakeholders that we see around companies like Tesla or Apple. These did not happen by accident, and these are both companies that have empowered their people to message through their with their stakeholders in creative and unconventional ways. Uh, so, you know, look at your own brand and say, am I allowing my people that opportunity? And if the answer is no, uh, you got some thinking to do. Yep. And, and Helen pointed out that we can, we can ruin our product by chasing perfect. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dusty Rhodes, not the wrestler, a uh, little tiny guy, actually <laughs> said, uh, you know, don't let perfect ruin great and don't let great ruin good. Like it's better to have, it's better to do something good now than find out the perfect thing later. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's part of this is like you said, it's okay to make mistakes. Two of the things that I love that Infotech did was when we started really expanding and investing in the live conferences, we brought in a professional speaker, Neil Peterson, amazing if you ever get the chance to hear him, mm -hmm. and also leveraged internal talent, people who had been on the speaking circuit for a while, to help coach and mentor and guide. And the quality of their ability to be on camera or on stage or facil facilitate a difficult workshop went up tremendously with the company making that investment in them and helping them tweak and learn some of the tricks to help out. And even with some of the LinkedIn Live now, partnering more experienced presenters with other people who did great research and are good on calls, but maybe they just need to translate that has really created a nice comfort zone for them to help develop their skills and eventually lead and mentor our next group of people. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. So as we're hitting the end of our show, we try and hold this to right around the 45 minute mark. We've all mentioned that what's important is being authentic and we like people who relate to us and all three of us are dog lovers. So I thought before we get to the final advice, um, what, what are your pups or pup? And uh, we do, we'll do a, a pup exchange uh, in comparison. I, we don't have pictures. I, I can't bring them up. We'll have to do that on another show. But uh, uh, who are the dogs that make our lives worth going to work so that we can spoil them with toys and treats? <laughs> Gosh, we don't, how much time do we have? No, I, yeah, I know we don't have all night. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll summarize it. My dog is Ollie. She's a boxer. She's Aww. five years old. She's a slobbery mess. And she's got a face only a mother would love. 
but I can get some good profile pics out of, out of her that everybody would think she's pretty cute at times. But uh, yeah, I never thought I would like a boxer. It was my husband's choice. Uh, but no, she's she's adorable, very emotional. I didn't realize how sensitive boxers can be. But yes. hey. They are our, wonderful. Uh, our, our pup is, uh, her name is Callie. She's a three-year-old miniature schnauzer. She's the second schnauzer that we've had. And uh, they are wonderful dogs, uh, incredibly loud, incredibly stubborn, incredibly annoying, um, but God, so loyal and so sweet. Uh, and just the, the, the most, like she's the literal center of our family. I just <laughs> noticed uh, my headshot for some reason, I. I don't know why, because I maybe it's pulling it in from Facebook, but you'll notice the headshot that I use for the HAPS platform has me holding her. Um, so, you know, she, I don't get a lot of sleep because of her, uh, but I wouldn't change things for the world. Our neighbors know her from a mile away because she's a barker. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised that she didn't bark today. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'll come back. We'll give her another chance. Um, but honestly, I, I, uh, you know, I've always had a soft spot uh, for dog people. Uh, I think I think dog people operate on a somewhat different level. It isn't logical. Uh, it's about you know unconditional love from this you know animal with whom you cannot speak because uh, they don't speak English. But good God, they understand everything that's going on, and uh, I can't imagine life without them. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, maybe that'll be a future show. The uh, the dogs of Infotech. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, we have five crazy rescues, uh, all of them approaching senior now. So uh, I'll save their introductions for another day. Uh, I, I hear that that's good to have a teaser and bring people back for a future show. So uh, I'll leave that out there. So as we go, uh, parting thoughts, uh, wrap ups, conclusions uh, for viewers. Anything in parting you'd like to share? Yeah, I hear all too often, you know, I, I don't do social media or I can't, or it's just not really what we do as an organization. Um, and I think, you know, I look at the calendar, it's 2021. It's time to, you know, put that in the past where it belongs. Um, it's, it's like trying to do business without a computer, right? This is a core tool, uh, whether you're an organization or an individual. Uh, and we've all got to get on the train one way or the other. Uh, and the only way to do that is to roll up our sleeves and, you know, try out what works for us um, and to be comfortable with failure uh, because we will fail along the way. But that's all part of the learning process. And uh, over time, you realize it allows you to get a lot more done uh, with a lot more people who are like minded to you than would otherwise be the case. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. I have to think about it when I, you know. I've been thinking about social media for a while and just kind of reflecting and it is about connection and it's like where it used to be. Uh, you know, I started with, what was it? MySpace. You guys remember MySpace? Hey, people in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Good old That's days. The Timberlake. <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, Facebook came, it was good. And it was about connections. And it was based on connecting with friends and connecting with people that you went to high school with. And I kind of want that again. And so I, I just encourage people to be caught to just be more kind and helpful and we it's it's immediate i don't know we have this urge to kind of like state our opinion on things that may be political or you know and, and we all have strong feelings and i i have to bite my tongue too and you know it's okay if you don't agree with me i'm you know i don't think it's my place on social media to tell you you're wrong i think i i want to listen more and kind of speak less. And that's what I'm, I'm personally wanting to practice on social is to, is to listen more and engage. And I don't know, maybe do more of these. I'm not sure yet. Uh, we'll see. Let me sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you both for taking time out after another busy day. Uh, for everyone, if you enjoyed uh, what we shared, please follow Stacy and Carmi on LinkedIn. They are posting relevant content, sharing articles, sharing what they're up to and what others are up to. So LinkedIn professionally is a great place to follow. If you want to see awesome pictures of Stacy's dog, I think Instagram got a mention. So find and follow yeah. her there. Uh, for everyone, uh, 
please uh, join us on Thursday. We're going to have an exciting show. I've got two, I'm going to call them mystery guest stars because one of them is trying to get permission from his spouse to be allowed to do the show and not tutor the kids. Um, but we're going to do a kind of a crazy, silly, and more humorous look at things that really shouldn't exist or shouldn't be true, but for some reason are. So some of those crazy conundrums, double standards, both personally and at work. Uh, I've got two wonderful people who are going to be part of that, who are both well known on the speaking circuit uh, and, and, and video casters themselves. So join us on Thursday and then also subscribe to Michael Bathurst. So you'll get the notifications about our casual business chat. It is usually on Sunday. Sometimes it pops up in the evening but it will be a little bit more of a fun, silly roller coaster than we just finished, but it's very enjoyable. So please follow him. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe, happy, and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you on a few.